When I was growing up in the early 2000s, there always seemed to be this interest on the playground with adult versions of kids' shows. No, it's not that rumored Adult Swim version of SpongeBob that some kids claim existed, but rather, it takes us to the episode Sailor Mouth, where the joke of the episode is the fact that the characters all swear, but the swearing is replaced by a dolphin sound effect. This makes the episode funny, and you might be wondering, what exactly is it that they beeped out in the episode? Well, Tom Kenny has confirmed that it was, in fact, real swear words that were being uttered by these characters and censored in the cartoon. You know, swearing without really swearing is hard, because they would just say ad lib uh, almost swearing. You know, it's not about the magic ad lib uh, fake swearing. And then we were like, this is too hard. Could we just really, really cuss and then you guys just bleep out? <laughs> <laughs> Listening to uh, Patrick and uh, Squidward and Mr. Krabs uh, really uh, uh, drop those bombs. <laughs> Maybe the funniest thing in the world, and also something you will never be allowed to hear, ever. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, this is something that hasn't been released or leaked at all. And as Tom Kenny states later in the panel, Nickelodeon probably has it buried at the center of the Earth. There would be no reason to ever release this audio, especially since, again, the joke of the episode was to beat the swears anyway. Even without this, the SpongeBob voice actors have been clipped swearing in different places and projects before, so we can get an idea of what the uncensored Sailor Mouth audio sounds like without actually hearing it. Even so, the topic is still something that gets brought up and discussed at conventions, as seen in a panel as recently as 2021. So, of course, Roger, this begs the question that I've been wondering about for years. Where's the tape? Where's the tape? <laughs> <laughs> See, they, they record uh, everything, uh, and then they record the actual words that we're saying. So, somewhere in Nickelodeon, there's this tape. And ever so often... Can one of you guys find it for me? I want a copy. Right. Yeah. Someone needs to leak that tape, then. Yeah. We all need to hear. In that old video I made talking about Playhouse Disney Lost Media, one of the most popular topics featured there was the Little Einsteins pilot, and to this day, it remains a desired piece of lost media. At the time, however, the search for what was considered the Little Einsteins pilot was very different from what has been unearthed recently, and it drastically changes what we're actually looking for. In the original video, I mentioned that a 40-second pilot was made in 2004 and pitched to Disney in hopes that the concept would get picked up into a full show. It worked, and that pilot was released as a trailer onto many VHS and DVDs to get people interested in the series. This in its entirety was believed to be the entire pilot, and attention then turned to a rumored second pilot that was made, which seemed more interesting to fans for its lack of information and mystery. However, this second pilot is not where the search effort should be, but rather back to that 42nd pilot, because it's been discovered that this is not all that it appears to be. While it might seem obvious now, this alleged pilot that was put onto home media released as a trailer is just that, a trailer. It's a compilation of different clips and scenes cut together that don't create a cohesive story. It's far from an actual pilot and was not pitched to Disney in this way, but rather, these clips come from a larger, fully animated pilot that was used as the original pitch, and that's what's currently lost. 180 Sideline reached out to me with more information about this topic, after having done research on it, and told me about a series of crew members they contacted asking about it, and was given a series of screenshots that completely proved the trailer was made from a full piece of animation. There are scenes in it that are not present in the trailer, and it was even pointed out that the characters in the swinging scene change places along with the earliest logo of the series appearing that we've seen so far. Unfortunately, the sources that 180 Sideline asked only had those images, and not the full pilot, while some of them didn't have anything at all. They also looked back through old interviews with crew members, but so far has come up empty-handed. Even though the search for this one has been slow, I'm glad we were able to get some new content from it, and even became aware that this was still lost in the first place. As for the second pilot, I don't think there's been any progress made on it, and its general mystery leaves much more in the way of research that needs to be done. 
The only evidence we even have that it exists is a trailer that uses a bunch of different scenes, similar to the first pilot. So it's possible that this exists in a similar way, and Disney has a full copy of the whole thing. Though there is also a credit from the website of a writer who mentions having written a pilot for Baby Einstein products that is going into production soon. Though it's not clear which pilot this is referencing, so it could be either one. But then, there's also a piece of artwork and early logo design on the same website, which feels like it would fit somewhere in the timeline of the second pilot, but the designs don't match up completely, so this is another mystery. 180 Sideline is not sure what this could go to. It definitely doesn't look like a screenshot or something that was animated, which means it's either something that was never animated, or it does relate to the second pilot in some way. I'll keep in touch with Sideline and see if they can unearth anything new, or contact the writer and ask for clarification about their credit. Even when you think a search has concluded, it just takes one new lead to change what you thought about it. I don't know what it is about spooky lost media or content that's intended to be scary, but there's something about it that draws people in. I'll admit, when I first started researching lost media, like cartoon pilots, the scary stuff is what I went out of my way to avoid. But nowadays, I find myself looking more into topics like these, and the story behind this next one is something I couldn't say no to. In the unidentified media section on the Lost Media Wiki forums, there's a post that was made on February 1st of 2023 that details a jump scare from the 2000s. Now, jump scares aren't anything new when it comes to lost media, but it's the bizarre and somewhat scary details surrounding this one that make it really stand out to me. The post goes on to explain they and their mother were watching reruns of an old show on the TV Land channel late at night, when. During a mostly normal commercial break, there was an ad that came on. It displayed scenery images like lakes, rivers, mountains, etc. I believe they were birds singing as well, and sound effects like the sound of water. Just ambience, mostly. But at the end, a woman popped up on the screen, and from my memory, her hair was standing on end, like in a cartoon and she let out this ear-piercing scream and the ad ended, and went back to normal commercials. There was never any context or explanation, and it never aired again. This was my first experience with a jump scare, and it was traumatizing. I have done pretty heavy research into it, and dug as deeply as I feel possible. The thread goes on to discuss some of the possibilities about what this could be. Though the obvious car jump scare and similar ads that copied that style were ruled out. This was apparently something different. CMK also mentioned that they weren't sure if this was a legit ad or some sort of hack. But further in the thread, Ko did make a good point. If this jump scare was indeed a legit ad, it would be possible to find, as sometimes TV Land would showcase old ads on the channel. So maybe it could have been a really old one that no one else even knows exists. CMK did mention they searched through compilations on YouTube, but didn't find anything that resembled the one they saw. So if it does exist, then it's probably not online yet. Personally, I really like the story behind its scariness. How it just popped up in the middle of the night on a channel no one would expect. But that's when it hit me that maybe this isn't all that it seems to be. While I am someone who likes to believe something is real before believing it's fake, there have been a lot of times on the forums where people point out the holes in topics that seem like they could be made up. And with this one, I couldn't help but realize this user is a new user of the site, has only posted about this topic, and every detail about it fits into that overused, late at night, traumatized me, never to be seen again style. In my post from the thread, I also mentioned that searching for a lost commercial like this reminds me of the Subway Perfection ad, and in some ways, you could make a point that this jump scare might have been a local troll that someone simply paid to have on TV for a night. But then you could also argue that the Subway Perfection ad had a lot more evidence and credibility behind the story compared to this single post on the forums. There's not really any way to get an exact answer about its legitimacy from this alone. So either searching for more jump scares, TV land commercial breaks, or maybe coming across more people that can remember it will help lead to a conclusion or even getting it found. 
I feel like it wouldn't be a real Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media video without revisiting a topic that hasn't really gained too much attention since I last covered it, but hopefully can get some new light shed on it, since it very much seems like something that only the fans will be able to unearth. When this topic first broke last year, it was a pretty big deal for the fact that nobody knew it existed at all, and it was in this shock where the search sorta of began. It was in a video on YouTube that user I'm Not Jonathan came across showcasing the collection of Smitty's Super Service Station, which is basically a museum of Chuck E. Cheese animatronics and memorabilia. There's so much content in this museum, and the tour videos are often so long, it takes someone with a lot of knowledge about Chuck E. Cheese to spot something like this topic. 50 minutes into the tour, the owner of the collection named Damon shows a book that contains animation cells from what is said to be a commercial for Chuck E. Cheese, and a newspaper clipping mentioning an animated TV spot. Together, these two pieces of evidence prove that a TV spot was said to have aired, and the cells are the remnants of that piece. At the time, details were very hard to come by, but some community members did uncover never-before-documented details about it, including that it only aired locally in California, sometime around the 1980s. It was also 30 seconds long and advertised birthday parties. These details are backed up by an employee newspaper from around the same time, that also mentioned a 30 second commercial that would be airing on TV, and another brochure that mentions the ad is part of a marketing TV package. Though aside from this evidence that points towards the commercial's existence, nobody seems to remember it exactly, and nothing visually from it has resurfaced besides the collection of cells. In fact, if it wasn't for these cells, and the fact that they were so heavily noticed by the community, I'm sure the commercial would still remain in obscurity, and nobody would have any idea that it existed in this way. It's interesting how the details seem to be in plain sight the whole time, which makes for a more interesting search. While there are no other visuals that we currently have, the cells have been scanned and run together to give us some kind of idea of what the commercial looked like, though I and many others would really like to see the whole piece. At the time, there was an idea thrown around that the company who animated it was called Colossal Pictures, while the storyboards were claimed to have been drawn by someone else, an artist who drew comics sold in the Pizza Time Theater restaurants. Though as far as I can tell, there hasn't been any exchange between former employees or animators at the company and the community itself, so perhaps this is still an area with possibilities to uncover. But aside from taking the contact route to get this commercial found, brings us to a hands-on effort that I always like to mention for these kinds of searches, and that's the fact that it aired locally. We know from the details previously uncovered that it aired locally in the 1980s, allegedly for a couple months, in the Stockton and Huntington Beach area of California. Most Pizza Time Theater restaurants were located in this area at the time, so it makes sense that the ad would have aired there. There was a list of TV stations that were active in the area at the time, which was compiled for reference. So combine that list with the knowledge that it aired locally, then you get a really good lead. If anyone from that part of the country remembers growing up during that time and recording TV content, you might have a piece of lost media in your collection. Though if this route doesn't give us any new leads, there is still the Colossal Pictures option, who were absorbed by bigger companies after having gone defunct in 1999. But they had a huge body of work while they were operating, and I'd be surprised if that content was not archived by the people who took over and simply tossed away. So we still have two leads that are full of possibilities to look at, in trying to get this animated piece of Chuck E. Cheese Lost Media found. On the topic of Cartoon Network and Adult Swim, comes another one that seems a bit obvious to include in a video like this. I can't actually believe I've never talked about it before because back in the day was a pretty big announcement that ended up becoming nothing. But to this day, we've yet to see any of the content that was made while it was in production. This takes us back to 2011, when Cartoon Network was going through a lot of programming changes. Adventure Time and Regular Show were still really new, Symbionic Titan and Thundercats were supposed to be the big new action shows, and Neo wanted to make a cartoon. This is called I Heart Tuesdays, and if you followed the channel closely back during those years, there's a pretty good chance you've heard about it before. The show was first announced on March 3, 2011, when it was reported that the singer had signed a deal with Cartoon Network to produce this cartoon that he created for his sister. As explained by Neo in this early interview, the plot of the cartoon is about a 16-year-old girl 
that inherits the curse of her bloodline, and she's forced to save the world from the unknown evil every Tuesday for the rest of her life. I remember at the time this was first announced, it sounded pretty promising. Cartoon Network didn't have a lot of cartoons with serious action plots at the time, but it also didn't sound too serious where it couldn't be dropped in with Adventure Time in the Monday Night Comedy spot. However, there wasn't much else mentioned about the series beyond its announcement for more than a year, when Neo talked about the series again in late November 2012. This time, the plot of the cartoon changed a little, with him stating in another interview with Jet Mag that the story is now about twins who are direct descendants of two Greek gods that were cursed by Zeus for being really childish and irresponsible. They have to save the world from some unspoken evil every Tuesday for pretty much the rest of their lives. So it's dealing with that on top of dealing with being high school students. The intercom comes on and the dean says, Hey guys, due to weather, prom's going to fall on Tuesday. While this premise gives the show a more mythical vibe compared to the first iteration where it was a family bloodline curse, it sounds like the direction didn't change too much, and maybe would have been more relatable by playing on the dynamic of twins. However, we don't really have any idea why the direction changed or how much was changed from the original idea, because nothing from these early planning stages has been made available. And it gets even more complicated the following year, in 2013, when the year came and went with the show being removed from Cartoon Network's list of upcoming content, which meant either the show was being heavily reworked or cancelled entirely. It's been a decade since that happened, with no official word given on the status of production, which means the result is likely the latter, that it was cancelled during production. With the exception of some educated guesses and implication, it's not known exactly why the show was canned. A common theory states that Neo's inexperience with animation and believing the process was easier than he thought played a large role. In some interviews, he's made comments about wanting to avoid expensive animation styles like the boondocks, mentioning that he'd be okay with using stick figures. This was probably more tongue-in-cheek than anything else, but even a show as simple as Adventure Time cost a lot to produce back then. Nothing from iHeart Tuesdays has resurfaced, and it's not known how much content was originally planned, though I would guess that something had to have been made for the original concept to change ideas. If concept art existed from that era of development, I'd really like to see it, and I still think the idea of the show sounds really cool. There aren't even a lot of mentions surrounding iHeart Tuesdays online, so if it hadn't been for those interviews and fans remembering it, there's a chance it would have become forgotten entirely. I hope you guys are as excited for this next topic as I am, because never did I think I'd get to talk about Nickelodeon in a video like this. It feels like the more time I spend looking into old Nickelodeon content, the more fascinating that content becomes, and it always seems to be more surprising than anything Cartoon Network or Disney Channel were doing at the time. Now, this topic is probably nothing that you're expecting it to be. It's not some weird Spongebob commercial or Lost Kids show but it's actually an entire block. An entire international Nickelodeon block that's almost completely lost. If you've looked closely at Nickelodeon lost media before, you've probably heard of Nickelodeon Japan, an official TV channel adaptation that ran for a decade over there. But I'm sure you never expected to find out that Nickelodeon also had an official Chinese counterpart as well, and it was called Haha ha Nick. Unlike Nickelodeon Japan, however, this wasn't its own channel, but rather a block of shows that aired on SMG children's channels. When I first came across this topic, I thought it was some kind of unlicensed adaptation that nobody at Nickelodeon was actually connected to. However, that's not the case, and it was a joint venture between Nick and SMG. Animation World Network reported on this in a 2005 article with MTV Network's vice chairman, Bill Rohde, who stated that, Launching an MTV brand service with China's leading mobile company and premiering the first content produced through our Haha ha Nick joint venture with SMG are strategically significant developments for MTV's and Nickelodeon's positions in China. China has the creative talent to become one of the world's leading animation hubs, and Haha ha Nick is tapping into the local industry to produce high quality programming that can be showcased in China and around the world. The block premiered on May 1st, 2005 to 3.5 million households, and was aired twice a day, 
with a morning slot from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and an evening slot from 4 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., of which both contained quite an interesting variety of shows. Before Haha ha Nick started airing, Cat Dog and the Wild Thornberries were already airing separately from the block, so a whole new variety of content was adapted, which includes The Fairly Odd Parents, Ubi, Blue's Clues, Eureka's Castle, Keenan and Kel, and Chalk Zone, all receiving Mandarin dubs. The block itself also contained some original content, like the Haha ha Nick Weekend Play, which was hosted in the studio, and Sonic, which highlighted lifestyle in Shanghai. In addition to this content, the hosts also introduced each show before it aired, with special animation and bumpers. However, what's unfortunate about the entire Haha ha Nick topic is how short-lived the block was, leading to the majority of its content being lost. Neither of the two original shows have resurfaced in episode form, or any of the special animations, but there is a good amount of content from the block that has shown up. Recently, YouTube user Fee uploaded a collection of bumpers and promos that they got using a Wayback Machine download tool, which searches across archived websites. While these uploads don't give us too much content from the hosts themselves, one of these promos uses clips from the lost Mandarin dubs of CatDog and Chalk Zone, so we can hear what they sound like, in addition to the existence of a red Spongebob looking mascot who seems to be a recurring character in the bumpers. In addition to this new collection are a couple of older commercials that have been on the wiki for a while too. There have also been a lot of archives from the Haha ha Nick website, including Ubi and Chalk Zone Flash games that also use voice actors from the Mandarin dubs. Interestingly, there's also another screenshot of the Pickboy character who appears, though this time with different clothing compared to the one that looks more similar to the US design. Unfortunately, Haha ha Nick only lasted two years in China, being cancelled in October 2007, which makes finding this content even more difficult than it was from so long ago. It also doesn't seem like the mention of creating original animation programs in China ever got off the ground as only existing shows were localized and nothing new was created from what we've seen. But there are several archived interviews from around the block's earlier years that stated ratings were reportedly very good, so maybe more of this content was saved somewhere. This first piece of lost media is one that could actually fit into a bunch of different video themes I've covered in the past, like lost media that will never be released, forgotten pieces of lost media, or even very rare pieces of Cartoon Network lost media, because this topic is pretty insane, and it's one that is unlike the majority of lost media I've come across before. It takes us to the old school Space Ghost Coast to Coast show that ran from 1994 to 2008 and helped kickstart Adult Swim. And during that time, some content from the show went missing. This includes a handful of pilots that were created early on for the series, and some lost episodes that were produced exclusively for the GameTap streaming service, which went missing after it was shut down. But the most interesting Space Ghost Coast to Coast lost media that I was informed of dates back to 1999, and isn't something that the public was supposed to see. Actually, it was quite the opposite. It was a piece of content that was only intended for one person to see. In the season 6 episode titled Snatch, the crew is seen in the studio as body snatching pods appear, which will eat and replicate the characters if they fall asleep. By the end of the episode, a scene plays which shows the three dozing off, and ends without a real conclusion, as it just cuts to black. The viewers aren't intended to know what actually happens, and this is where the lost media comes in. As the original airing was paired with a special promotion that has remained lost for all these years. During the episode's original airing in 1999, after the three fall asleep, co-producer Dave Willis appears dressed as a colonial man in a live action sequence which informs the viewers that if they want to know how the episode really ended, they'll have to bid on a script that contains the ending in an auction on eBay. There's even a subtitle at the bottom of the screen that advertises this promotion, though it wasn't made just to troll the viewers or intentionally create a piece of lost media. Instead, all proceeds of the auction would be donated to charity. And indeed, this sale did take place, as screenshots from the 1999 listing have been archived and passed around over the years. 
Nick's Space Ghost tribute site appears to be one of the sources for this screenshot, and from here, we can gather some details about it. The opening bid was $7, it had been bid up to $250 at the time this screenshot was taken, and its description reads, Were Space Ghost and his fabled gang devastated by the green replicating pods? Only one person will find out. Bid on this one-of-a-kind ending, typed on extra bright, dual-purpose, zero-graphic paper in luxurious 12-point courier font. Signed by the cast and crew of Space Ghosts Coast to Coast. Mint condition. Stored in a smoke-free home. All proceeds donated to charity. According to the fan site, the final selling price for the script was $1,000, and has never resurfaced in any form, official or unofficial. We don't even know who actually won it, other than a user named Broly22, being the highest bidder at the time the screenshot was taken. Nobody knows what was in the script, and most of the public knowledge surrounding it is limited to the Colonial Man scene at the end of the episode. Though while I was editing this segment for the video, I happened to scroll down a little farther in the Lost Media Wiki article and read the comments, which creates a little speculation on who actually ended up with the script. The owner of Nick's Space Ghost fan site, who interestingly mentions that the screenshot was saved by another user from a completely different website, says that rumors about the winner of the script were passed around back in the day. According to this comment, it wasn't Broly22, the highest bidder in the screenshot, who won the script, but rather, the webmaster of a certain Scooby-Doo website. There is no other information mentioned, and I have no idea how true that could be, but it's an interesting piece of insight from someone who was active online back when the auction went up. The writers have also never spoken about its content, and in fact, the fan site speculates that it might not even be a literal script, because we've never actually seen it. In future airings of the episode, the live action scene was cut out as the auction was over, and text that read the end was added over the black transition. No other promotions were done in the same way, though the Colonial Man scene itself was included as a bonus feature in the Volume 5 DVD release. When you think about lost pilots, this is one category of lost media that everyone likes and hopes the lost media will be found. There are still so many old and new topics that have yet to be uncovered, like Meso Blues. But have you ever come across a pilot that is still at its original company and will never be released? And one that even if it did release, would you really want to check it out? I'm sure there would be an interest in it for the controversy that happened during filming, but it's also for that reason why you might not really want to watch it. We'll just have to talk about it because it's something really out of the ordinary. In early 2000, MTV was filming for a new show titled Dude This Sucks, which was intended to be a bizarre talent show where two teams would compete against each other in acting out strange performances. During these performances, a panel of judges would watch the acts, and if they believe the performance sucks, they slam down their hammer while the audience exclaims, Dude, this sucks. It kind of reminds me of that old show they brought back a few summers ago called The Gong Show, where contestants would showcase weird skills, and the judges would hit the gong if the act was dumb. But with Dude, this sucks, things got out of hand at the taping of the original pilot, and that sent the show into immediate cancellation. I should point out that because of the controversy and its immediate cancellation, there is no footage or even pictures of Dude This Sucks, so we only have archive descriptions and articles to go off of. The story goes that one of the acts that performed during filming were called the Shower Rangers, and acted out a campfire sequence during their first segment. Then in the next segment, they got up, turned around, and aimed their rear ends at three girls who were also on stage with them, and sprayed them with bodily waste. Information states that the Shower Rangers had taken a powerful laxative before the performance, allowing them to perform such an act, but the girls had no idea any of this was going to happen. Apparently, they had only been instructed by studio employees to stand at a certain place on the stage, without any other information. This led to a whole lot of controversy between the girls, who were middle schoolers, their parents, and MTV, two of which sued the network in 2001, with one of the girls stating, We were having a good time until the second act of Dude This Sucks went on. 
All of a sudden, I was smelling something disgusting, and I started to gag. I looked around at my friends, they were covered in something. As I looked down at myself, I realized that I was too. The other girl mentioned that everyone at school became aware of the incident, even the teachers. They would crack jokes and wouldn't go near the girls because they said they smelled, even though they washed everything off. The president of programming at the time vowed that the footage would never be aired or released, and made his own statement about it. This was a terrible incident. It was unintended, and we regret that it happened. I was not aware of the content of this segment prior to the taping, and have taken steps to ensure that an incident of this nature never happens again. It's too bad that such an unfortunate incident happened that resulted in the cancellation of a brand new show. And like I said before, there is no content from any part of the pilot online. Considering this was also filmed in the year 2000, it's unlikely anyone has bootleg recordings either. Apparently, it was filmed in a remote location during an MTV weekend festival. Should we talk about a little Nintendo Lost Media in this video? Yeah, I think so, let's do it. It feels a little bit like cheating though, because you could argue that all of Nintendo's game betas and Lost Media are likely to never be released, since the company doesn't really go out of their way to share old content, and their archives aren't even that organized, as we've discovered throughout the Slamfest search. But the topic for this video is one that I found particularly interesting for the fact that it sounds like an early concept for Mario Maker. And I really like Mario Maker, so it caught my attention more than other Nintendo game betas. This is Donkey Kong Plus, a game whose title doesn't really sound like a game we're familiar with, but it's actually an early version of Mario vs. Donkey Kong, which was released on the Game Boy Advance in 2005. This earlier iteration existed three years before that, in 2002, and its original concept was quite different than the final product we got. Donkey Kong Plus was first revealed at E3 2002, as a tech demo which utilized the connecting cable between the GameCube and Game Boy Advance, with its main gameplay feature being that of level creation, similar to Mario Maker. Players could construct a course with different platform pieces, enemies, and items that can be seen in the final game. The gameplay was split between the two consoles, with the GameCube functioning as the level editor, and the Game Boy Advance being where you played them. Apparently, the levels could even be saved to a GameCube memory card and possibly shared between friends if they had a copy of the game too. Unfortunately, there isn't too much other information about this game which includes only a handful of screenshots and footage of it running at E3. It's not entirely known why the game ended up being cancelled and reworked into Mario vs. Donkey Kong, but it probably had to do with the connectivity between the GameCube and Game Boy Advance, which was not the most popular gameplay method. You would have needed both consoles, the cable, and a memory card to fully use its features. The abundance of peripherals is also the reason why so many other games from this era were reworked or cancelled, like Stage Debut. However, even though we can't play Donkey Kong Plus as a released game, there actually is a level editor that was left in the code for Mario vs. Donkey Kong that can be accessed by changing a single byte in it. This can't be accessed through normal means though, so it's not something easy to unlock. Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2 on the DS did include a level editor though, that was four years later. But if Nintendo is looking for new game modes to add to a Mario Maker 3, this one would get my approval, and would be something everyone can have fun with. When you think about lost media from Chuck E. Cheese and its related brands, one of the first categories that probably comes to mind are the animatronics themselves, because they're such a large part of the Pizza Time Theater experience. But you might be wondering how exactly animatronics can go missing in the first place, and there will be a few different examples in this video on what counts. But for this topic, I want to discuss one of the most fascinating lost animatronics that I've ever come across. This is about an animatronic character named Wolfman Zap, who was not used in any Chuck E. Cheese location, but rather, he was the main character featured in his own line of restaurants, called Zap's Bar and Grill. Contrary to the kid style of Chuck E. Cheese restaurants, Zap's Bar and Grill was catered to an older crowd, 
and was considered the adult equivalent to Chuck E. Cheese. However, very little is even known about Zapp's Bar & Grill at all, due to the fact that the chain was short-lived and proved not to be a successful venture at all, with the only content from it that's readily available being a series of old articles and interviews where Zapp's Bar & Grill was discussed early on in its life. In fact, the restaurant itself could be considered lost media for the fact that not a single photo or video from inside the bar has ever resurfaced. We have no idea what it even looked like. Though this does make some sense as, since it was a bar, there would be no real reason for patrons to film themselves inside of it, unlike families that take home recordings of their kids at Chuck E. Cheese. The majority of locations for Zapp's Bar & Grill were opened near the west coast. So if there was ever a chance for some homemade content to show up, it would most likely be from around that area of the country. Now, Zapp's Bar & Grill as a location is one story, but the character of Wolfman Zapp is another. Because while he's mostly remained as elusive as the Bar & Grill he was named after, there has been some very interesting information and sightings of the character since his creation. Firstly, as we've never seen any photos of the inside of the restaurant, it's not known where or how exactly Zap performed in it, or if he even performed at all. At the time, character animatronics used show tapes, which are the programming and audio information that allowed them to come alive, so it would be reasonable to conclude that Wolfman Zap had one as well, but none have ever been found. The Lost Media Wiki article speculated that Zap may have used some adult humor in his set for the fact that it was an adult restaurant, but that's completely unconfirmed. Though even if a show tape for the character was found, we would still need some kind of video showing how he moved to get a full understanding of what he performed like. It's also not known if Zap was a retrofitted animatronic, meaning his insides are that of an already existing character, but got its clothing changed on the outside, or if he's a completely new creation altogether. Only a handful of pictures showing the character in one piece have resurfaced, and for a long time, these were the only ones available until a miraculous find. In July 2015, it was discovered through an Instagram post that an animatronic with a striking resemblance to Wolfman Zap had been spotted in the back of a pickup truck. This image has been widely circulated online and led to speculation about how recent the photo was or if this was even a Wolfman Zap animatronic at all. While the original post has been deleted, another photo would show up sometime later from Tumblr showing another angle of the same setup. It seems like the character was attached to the truck in the front, rather than being in the back, and this is for good reason. Apparently, this vehicle is used in the Carson Valley Days Parade, run by the 2030 Club out of Nevada. That makes a lot of sense, considering Zapp's Bar & Grill had a location in Reno, Nevada. Nostalgia Cow confirmed these details, but was unable to verify if Wolfman Zapp was still part of the parade, or get any new pictures of him. If you compare the animatronic to some of the photos where he has his glasses on, it's a little hard to tell if it's the same one, but there's one picture that matches up almost perfectly. There couldn't have been many of these made, if there were only five locations, so it's a mystery how this ended up in a parade at all, or if we'll ever see another one. On the topic of pilots that look different from what we ended up getting, here's another one that has yet to be found in full, despite how often it gets discussed and is sort of the last of what I called the Nick Jr. trifecta. For a really long time, and probably even to this day, there were always a series of Nick Jr. pilots that would be brought up together, to the point where I often grouped them together. These were the Super Y pilot, the Bubble Guppies pilot, and the Team Umizumi pilot. For some reason, everyone liked talking about all three. However, both the Super Y pilot and Bubble Guppies pilot have both been found which leaves Team Umizumi the last of these three to resurface. Similar to the previous two, the Team Umizumi pilot featured many major differences from the final show, and even had a history from before its time on Nick Jr. Back in 2006, the original concept for the show was created, with the show having been titled The Umizumis, and featured two additional characters that were not included in the final show. The Lost Media Wiki mentions their names are Zigzag and Alphonse, and can be seen alongside the other three characters in some concept art, who would later go on to be in the final show. Apparently, it took a while for the show to get off the ground, two years in fact, 
until a pilot was finally made in 2008 and pitched that same year. But rather than being pitched to Nick Jr., it was first pitched to Noggin and was supposed to air in 2008 on the channel. However, that didn't happen, and instead, the show was pitched to Nickelodeon, where it was greenlit and scheduled to air on Nick Jr.'s morning block. During this period, the show was reworked, becoming what we know it as today, with its final title and dropping the other two characters. As for its original iteration and pilot, there's some content from it that can be seen. The big find, though, is a short clip of the pilot that was first uploaded to YouTube in 2018 without any audio. But later in 2020, the same clip from 2018 was re-uploaded, however, this time it had audio. It's not known where this complete clip originated from, but the Lost Media Wiki article makes a guess about its source, and I agree, it's a very likely possibility. It's mentioned that the clip with audio might have come from a video called Nicket Uber Hot Mix Lossless, which has sort of taken on an urban legend status at this point. Apparently, that was the title of an internal compilation video from Nick that contained content from pilots and internal use materials never supposed to be seen by the public. However, it was somehow accidentally made public for a short while, and some people ended up finding it while it was up, but hasn't been seen since. I went on a mini search for it years ago, I think when I was looking into the Bubble Guppies pilot, which is where some of the earliest screenshots of it were said to be sourced from, but I didn't find anything from the video. You can come across some old mentions of the video on various wikis, and even links to it, but none of them work, and nobody that I've talked to has the video or has seen it since. I'm not convinced that nobody out there has it, it seems like the kind of thing that enough people knew about at the time for someone to have saved. But then again, it's not really known how much content from each show was actually contained in it. I'm sure it wasn't the majority of these pilots and only clips, but that would still be nice to confirm. I'm not sure if the Umizoomies is something that any of the crew members would have, or something similar to the Bubble Guppies pilot that could only be leaked from an anonymous source who has access to it. Remember how popular those online virtual pet games were in the mid-2000s? For some reason, this seemed to be one of the most popular eras for them, and if you were like me, Webkins was the icon of the genre. But there were a lot of other competitors too, like Neopets, and a handful of knockoffs that have fallen into obscurity. But before all of that, Nintendo of all companies tried their hand at creating a game like this, in what might be one of, if not the earliest online virtual pet games that ever existed. I'm really surprised I had never heard about this topic before reading about it in the forums, as there's already a pretty extensive collection and community surrounding lost Nintendo Flash games. But this thread by Juxtaposition from late 2022 talks about a lost Yoshi Flash game that was released to celebrate Yoshi's story, and says, It was a browser game from 1998 to 2001 where you would take care of a baby Yoshi. You had to have an insider account to play you had to check in on him every day. Followed by a huge list of links that related to content from the game. The first several were ones that Nintendo had on their website, from their main page, the Insider account pages, and the Yoshi Story site. But unfortunately, they were not saved correctly, and all of the links either redirect to Nintendo's current website or 404. It's cool that we have the URLs, but since they don't operate correctly, there's nothing we can gather from them. However, what's really useful to have been saved is a link to an Angel Fire fan site that documents other users' Yoshis. I'm always amazed that there seems to exist one or two of these still operating for all of Nintendo's oldest content. The site describes itself as a collection page for fellow Yoshi fans to display their pets and tell everyone what their score was. While there are only a couple Yoshis that were ever added to this page, these entries give us a great idea of some of the game's mechanics. Similar to other online pet games, there were a variety of stats connected to the Yoshis, including age, date, time, color, a description, and usual mood. These are archived in the profiles that users submitted to the website. The GIFs that are included in this page were also taken from the game itself though some of the profiles also list an erased date, so perhaps the game had a statistic for when a Yoshi is deleted. 
Other than these graphics, there is no other gameplay available, and it's not entirely clear how the game worked or what it even looked like. To even play the game, you needed to have an Insider account on Nintendo's website, so it was locked behind that and wasn't available to play just by going to their site, unlike many of the other Flash games Nintendo released. GameSpot even wrote an article about it back in 2000, which mentions most of the same information from the fan site, but also says players can compete to get the top Yoshis. One of the Yoshis from the owner of the fan site mentions that one of their erased Yoshis made it to rank 59 by eating a lot of melons. There were also a couple of Reddit threads that mentioned the game's existence that were linked here, but again, they didn't gain any interest. If there's any way to recover more content from this piece of Nintendo Lost Media, the game sounds like it would be worth the effort to archive. I can't think of a better topic to start the video than with one that looks so weird, you'd have no idea what it is you were even looking at without getting a description of what's going on. Not only that, but its existence reminds me pretty heavily of A Day with Spongebob, for the fact that it's the strangeness of the cover that really pulls you in. If it hadn't been for goofing around late at night in a livestream once, then I probably never would have come across it, so you can thank my livestream audience from that night for why you're looking at this now. Gaze upon the lovely primitive CGI, confusion about what's even happening in this image, and foreign language on top, creating this topic. It's called Tales in Mushroom Village, a 2009 CGI animated series that was produced in China and animated by Anhui Lister 3D Animation. When I first saw the image of this show on stream, I really had no idea what I was even looking at, unsure of what was going on or who the characters were even supposed to be. My first thought was that they were kids and this was supposed to be some kind of preschool show, but then I noticed that one of them had a tail, so maybe they were supposed to be animals and just rendered really poorly. Well apparently, if we take a closer look at a different image from the show, it becomes a little more clear what it's about. The series is indeed about anthropomorphic animals, who live in a village called Mushroom Village that the title mentions, with clear depictions of mushrooms in the background here. According to the Lost Media Wiki article, the series centers on this squirrel character named Now Now, who moves to the Mushroom Village and has to fit in with his surroundings. And well, despite its obscurity, there are some pieces of content from it that you can find online. Firstly is a pretty long trailer that can be found on YouTube, showing a variety of different clips from the series, and giving us an idea of what the show was really like. Here, we can see Now Now quite well, along with several other details not seen in the promotional images. While the majority of the scenes do look awkward, and feel like something you'd find on a low budget DVD in the bargain bin, a few of them don't make the characters look as unsettling as they do in the images. There's even a funny cameo that shows the King of Fighters game being played on one of the characters' laptops. However, this is not all the content that's available online. This second promotional image that we looked at is actually the cover of a DVD release it had, with Chinese and English subtitles, which seems to have been uploaded in full to YouTube, giving us the most extensive look at the series so far, and reveals even more secrets about it, like how the background soundtrack isn't original, and instead uses remixed versions of Kokiri Forest from Zelda Ocarina of Time. However, this is mostly all we've ever seen of the show, and information about its production and release is even scarcer than the content shown here. Pages discussing tales in Mushroom Village are almost non-existent, and even what has been found is in Chinese and limited in what it talks about. The series had a total of 100 episodes made for it, all with a runtime of 20 minutes each, but currently, only 10 of those 100 were the ones that were released on DVD, and all the others have not been, and is the only home media release that the series received. I suppose it would be possible to get Chinese viewers who saved these episodes when they were airing to upload them online, but without more information, it's not even known which network in China broadcast the series to begin with, so that's a pretty big dead end there as well. There's also a mention that the show was licensed to air in the United Arab Emirates, so it seems to have actually been shown outside of China, but even so, the animation company who made it seems to have gone out of business, and their website is gone as well. So the specific details of this and where to look for more episodes might never be known. Like I mentioned during the introduction, there's a piece of Gorilla's content that's connected to Adult Swim 
that I never would have expected to exist at all. And that's the next topic we're going to discuss. It's such a weird crossover that doesn't need to exist, but it's funny that it does, and has been a talking point of many Gorillaz fans in trying to get it found. Not only just to archive some lost media, but also for the fact that this was online at one point. If someone had saved it, we wouldn't be looking for it right now. The show in question that Gorillaz collaborated with was Tom Goes to the Mayor, an adult swim show that aired for a couple years in the mid-2000s. It was created by Tim and Eric of Awesome Show Great Job fame, but this crossover with Gorillaz happened years before that, in the middle of Tom Goes to the Mayor's run in 2005. Ever since it was first discovered, this image has been floating around online, showing the band at the mayor's office with the two characters from the show in view. This is one of the only pieces of content from the crossover, and upon first glance, it tells a much different story than you might believe. Thinking that it might have been a collaboration for a new song or a music video, but it wasn't either of those. Instead, it was an interview with the band, and as recollected by user Barry Nomad, it involved Tom asking stupid questions to which Gorillaz replied with silly answers, the kind of funny talking you'd expect from each party. While the idea of these characters interacting is pretty humorous, there's a huge misconception about this interview, and that's the kind of format it was conducted in. What myself and many other users believed after having seen this image is that it was some kind of animated segment like the show, or some kind of exclusive online content, possibly even a short that had been aired on TV. But neither of these is actually correct, and instead, as confirmed again by Barry Nomad, this was a text interview, sort of like an article you'd have to read. This piece of art was posted as a header, and everything else was text. There was no animation or any voice acting involved. Now you might be asking yourself, if this is just a text interview, and we have the only photo from it, we could find someone who saved the text itself, or check the website where it was posted, and see if there's an archive of it. Well, both of these options have proved difficult, firstly with the original website source. The interview was originally posted on timanderic.com in August 2005, which can be accessed on the Wayback Machine. You can see that same image and a listing for the interview, but the interview itself wasn't saved and can't be found this way. This leads into the second issue with trying to find the interview, as it's not a matter of finding someone that saved all the text and could just repost it but instead, the interview itself was one big image. The typed out text was within the file format of the entire piece, so you couldn't copy and paste it, but rather you had to save the entire image. This means to get a hold of it, we're going to have to find someone that saved the whole image, which hasn't been easy. Barry Nomad said the file name was called gorint.jpg, and even though you can find some discussions about this online from old fan sites and forums, it seems as though nobody in the community actually saved that image. I think it would be much easier to search for this topic if it was animated, for the fact that more people probably would have wanted to save it. It seems like there's never an end to the mysteries surrounding old video games, whether that's related to betas, unlockables in the game, or in this case, cancelled games that never came out. The games from this kind of era are especially interesting to talk about when you look back into the 90s, long before companies would directly reach consumers through social media, and fans had to rely on gaming publications or the press to give them accurate information. Now we've talked about plenty of rumored games on the channel before, but this topic is one that I've actually never heard about and really wonder how it would have worked at all if it released. Well, if it was actually planning on being released in the first place, I should say because we're not sure the game was ever even in development at all. Let's take a look at Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, a Japanese arcade game that was pretty mysterious for much longer than you might expect. I remember back in the early 2010s, having first come across this game not knowing what the heck it was, thinking that Mighty and Ray were actually prototype designs to Tails and Knuckles back then. But nowadays with these characters' new popularity, the game is a lot more well known. It was released in 1993 in Japanese arcades only, and famously featured a special trackball as a controller to move the characters through a series of platforming levels. However, it was because of this special control method that has to this day prevented a re-release of the game from ever happening, as the control scheme is said to be too hard to recreate with a normal game controller. Sega Sonic the Hedgehog was supposed to be included in Sonic Gems collection on the GameCube, but cancelled as a result of this. 
though apparently new information has come forward that suggests the GameCube was not the first console where a home port was attempted to be made. And this brings us to a video game magazine. Two video game magazines, in fact. In the October 1994 issue of Computer and Video Games, as well as Mean Machine Sega, both UK articles reported on rumors that Sega Sonic the Hedgehog was being ported to the 32X add-on for the Mega Drive. Though if you read each mention closely, it never actually says Sega Sonic and only says the Sonic the Hedgehog arcade game in a single line of text without any more details. It's implied that this is referencing Sega Sonic, as the Waku Waku Sonic car was the only other arcade game out at the time, and it wasn't much of a game. But what's unfortunate is that there are no other details given about the project. This means it was either so early on in development that nothing had even been done on it yet, or it never really existed and this was just a rumor. The Lost Media Wiki article mentions that both of these magazines were published by EMAP, which implies the rumor of the port came from the larger company itself. And considering there was never a mention of this game anywhere else at the time, that seems likely. So the question remains about if this was actually planned, or if it was another fake rumor to catch people's attention, as was so common back in those days. I suppose it would be possible to track down some of the writers for these magazines if they're online, and ask them directly about it, but even if it was planned, it's not surprising why it was cancelled. Releasing Sega Sonic the Hedgehog would have meant releasing a special trackball controller that nobody would have bought for one game, especially for an add-on like the 32X that was discontinued around a year after the game was mentioned. The wiki article also says that the port could have been considered for the Sega Saturn at a later time, but there's no evidence to suggest that and it's only speculation. I do remember coming across some magazine scans that mentioned Sonic the Fighters was planned to be released on the Saturn, which we know was supposed to happen. And while that game never came out, maybe if it had been successful, it would have given Sega more confidence to try another arcade port, and Sega Sonic would have finally had its console home. Not to mention, with all the weird peripherals that did release in Japan for the Saturn, it probably wouldn't have felt that weird to release a trackball controller for one game, especially when that game was Sonic. This next topic takes us to a completely different side of collecting, involving anime merchandise rather than video game stuff. While I always feel like I've been too dedicated to video game merchandise collecting, to have time or resources to spend on anime merchandise, as I find myself getting back into Naruto and Bleach from my childhood, it's also a lot of fun buying all the new figures that are surprisingly still being made. And while reliving my original Naruto fandom, I found myself going back to take a closer look at the action figure line Mattel made in 2006 as part of the original series from when it was airing on Cartoon Network. This line had a wide variety of characters that hold up pretty well to this day. A lot of people like to criticize this line for its sculpts and gimmicky action features, but the original characters from the set, like Orochimaru, Iruka, and Zabuza, really stand out. They're the only posable figures of these characters that have ever been made, and it's unlikely such characters will ever be revisited. For that reason, I love the line, so I started researching more of it, and once having gone down the Mattel Naruto rabbit hole, you can find some hidden gems, and of course, lost media. There are some really limited figures that I had never even seen as a kid, like Curse Mark Sasuke and Lotus Kick Rock Lee. But then there are a few others that seem to have been cancelled, like Lightning Blade Kakashi and Claw Attack Gara. The only photos of them that exist are from Toy Fair. There's also a Jirobo that never came out and can only be seen on the back of a box, though all three characters have resurfaced as test shots over the years. But while doing all this research on Mattel Naruto figures, I came across a Reddit thread showcasing another figure I had never seen before but it was the title of it that really caught my attention. It was called The Rarest Official Naruto Figures in Existence, Only Two Ever Made, and contains a photo showing two boxed Naruto figures with the nine-tailed fox chakra, marked as being from Wizard World and Comic-Con 2006. The user who posted these, named Shogunian, provided some details about what these were, stating, they were given out by Mattel as lottery prizes during SDCC and Wizard World in 2006, one for each convention. 
Naruto's eyes and the Kyubi Chakra eyes are actual rubies. The Naruto figure is the same mold as the standard Mattel Naruto, but with a different face. The Kyubi mold was never reproduced. More of the story surrounding these figures is revealed in the thread. Apparently, the two winners of these figures both sold them off in 2006, not fully knowing how rare and perhaps valuable they were. And Shogunian confirms that they were only able to acquire them as a result of hearing about the figures beforehand and actively sought them out around the time of these conventions. I wish I could find the official announcement for these. I remember them being featured in an issue of Shonen Jump magazine in 2006, but I'm not sure which issue it was. As far as I know, that was the only time they were ever mentioned. And this is where the search begins. We know for certain that the figures exist. They were both resold, and as of this thread from four years ago, are still with Shogunian. So the mystery isn't about what happened to the figures, but rather, where the original advertisement is mentioning them. As mentioned in the original thread, the advertisement for the figures was allegedly seen in a Shonen Jump from 2006. But unfortunately, I only had a few issues from that year. Still, it would be worth looking through my copies before purchasing new issues, in case I just don't remember seeing it. But I flipped through them and didn't see anything mentioning the Mattel figures. The September issue, strangely, even advertises a contest to win Mattel figures right next to Naruto's head. But there isn't anything that mentions figures in this issue either. I even looked through the manga pages where they sometimes insert extra content, and even checked the mail away card in the front, but didn't find anything useful. I have no idea what this headline is in reference to, but after coming up empty handed, I asked for some help from someone on Twitter who has a complete collection of shonen jumps to look through, and even they came up empty handed. It appears as though the announcement for this figure was not from a shonen jump, and with that conclusion, I'm not sure where else to begin searching for it. There were a few different anime magazines that were released in 2006, so it could have been in any of them. But without even a date to begin at, you'd have to search the first six months of every magazine, given how the conventions took place over the summer. If you've ever seen an advertisement for the Ruby Eye Naruto figures, be sure to let me know. I've said this before but I'll say it again, because it still holds up. You never know what you're going to find by browsing articles and threads on the Lost Media Wiki. There have been so many times where I've found topics I never would have seen otherwise, and sometimes they really pique my interest, like this next one, which I actually did a lot of research on months ago, but currently, it's still up for debate about if it's real. In April of this past year, I came across a newly written article about Pawn Stars of all shows. I remember watching Pawn Stars growing up, but never figured there'd be any lost media related to the show, so I quickly found myself on wanting to uncover this content. This isn't a lost episode or some kind of pilot to the show, but rather, an entire precursor to the show itself, from 8 years before it premiered on the History Channel. There are rumors that claim, in 2001, PBS produced a documentary about the Gold and Silver Pawn Shop, the one from the show, and that the documentary in itself is entirely lost. Currently, the earliest TV appearance of the shop is a segment from Dave Attell's show in 2003, so if this PBS documentary really exists, it would be from two years prior. I think archiving that kind of content would be so cool to see, but unfortunately, there is only a little bit of evidence to even start searching with. The entire claim that this documentary exists in the first place is sourced to an article from the Huffington Post in 2012, where it's mentioned by name, having apparently come from a secondary source that contains a large index of articles. But if you actually go through that index and look through the details yourself, you'll find that there's no mention of a Pawn Stars PBS special in it at all. It's like the Huffington Post just made it up and didn't actually get the information from anywhere. But if you read further into that article, it gets a little more interesting, as it contains a quote from Rick Harrison, one of the owners of the shop, who appears on the show. If you do a Google search for this quote online, it doesn't seem to exist anywhere else. Again, it's like the Huffington Post just made this up. It's another detail of this article that isn't sourced and can't be found anywhere else. Though just because the quote doesn't have a source, doesn't exactly mean it's fake. 
the Lost Media Wiki article for this topic speculated that it might have come from a 2011 GIA symposium where Rick spoke. But unfortunately, that entire conference is lost too, so we can't verify if it actually came from there. I tried to find a copy of that too, thinking that someone must have recorded it as Pawn Stars was big enough in 2011 for someone to want to save it. Which is when I found an article that talked about the symposium that wrote about Rick having spoken at it. Now what's most important about this article are two different details. One is that it once again mentions Rick having starred in that PBS documentary that no one can seem to find, but second is that the article is dated June 2011. This predates the Huffington Post article by a year and is the earliest mention of this lost PBS documentary online, meaning the Huffington Post article isn't relevant anymore as they could have just taken their information from here which definitely could have happened. But now the question becomes, where did this article get its information from? I noticed that the way it's written, they either did have a copy of the Lost Symposium event, watched it, and took quotes from it, or had someone else at the event take notes and write the article after. There's also a video of Rick answering a question at the event, so I would trust that this information is accurate which means it's possible we're looking at the origin of the PBS documentary claim. However, to confirm that idea, I would still like to know where the article got its information from, if it had a copy of the symposium, or if there's some third source out there that this site actually took the PBS documentary claim from before June 2011. In a separate part of this search, I also did look briefly on the PBS website on the Wayback Machine to see if there were any mentions or listings of the documentary there, but I didn't find any. I'm guessing it wouldn't be there or someone would have found it by now, but if it was released as part of a specific series or had an unexpected title, it could be hiding without anyone knowing it's there. It's also very possible that the mention of a PBS documentary is some kind of misunderstanding or misremembering over the years that's been passed around so heavily it's been taken as fact. Pawn Stars did have a couple earlier pilots that were made and rejected, so maybe someone confused it with one of those, or actually saw a different PBS documentary and thought it was Pawn Stars. It wouldn't be the first time someone remembered content that didn't exist, but it would be nice to get an answer on if it's real, or if it's fake, when the information that it existed started being taken as fact. If you're an older collector like I am, who started buying Sonic stuff way before the days of releases from Jazzwares and Jack's Pacific, then you know how popular the Japanese UFO plushes of the 90s and 2000s were within the collecting scene. Sets like the Sonic the Fighters, Adventure, and X series were so iconic within the community, and I knew of several people who specialized in only collecting Sonic plushes back then. It was a pretty high tier category and came with a lot of respect from other members. But aside from all of the well known Sonic plushes that had been seen back then, there were always a handful that remained more elusive. Some of these include the Sega World Sydney set, which includes the only plushes for Sally and the Sad AM design of Eggman in existence, as well as the Jumbo Cal Toy Sonic from the Best Buy raffle, which had only been spotted in a couple low quality pictures. But there's one set of Sonic plushes that, even back then, had rarely been seen and to this day remain a mystery when it comes to their release and their whereabouts. It all started in the mid 2000s on the defunct Japanese website Anime Mate, who specialized in reselling UFO plushes from that special 90s and early 2000s era of products. Their site was one of the first places I even discovered a lot of the old Sonic and Mario sets as their photos were some of the only ones online at the time. They were constantly finding new stock and updated pretty frequently. Well, if you happen to check their Sonic plush section at any point in the mid 2000s, you might have come across a Knuckles plush that upon first glance doesn't look like anything out of the ordinary. In fact, it looks pretty similar to the Knuckles plush that was released normally as part of the Adventure series. But a closer inspection reveals that this is much more than a regular UFO plush. And no, it's not just because of Yuji Naka's signature on the shoe. Unlike the Adventure UFO plush, which has plastic eyes and soft shoes, this plush has iron on eyes, an open mouth, and vinyl shoes, with a slightly different construction overall. 
But it's the description that really begins the mystery, as this Knuckles plush is apparently a promo item from Sonic Team that was given away at an event called Sonic Show 1997. At the time, I had never come across any other listings of this plush aside from the one here, and to date, this is still the only listing I've ever seen for it, on top of the fact that it's not mentioned anywhere else online either. But it doesn't stop there and gets even more interesting if you visit the Wayback Machine to an even earlier capture from Anime Mate. Apparently, in addition to Knuckles, the website has a listing for Sonic from the Sonic Team series as well. Yes, that's right, there's a Sonic that goes to this undocumented set of plushes. At the time, never to be seen or mentioned outside of this listing. Unfortunately, no images were saved of it in this capture. But in the years that have passed since first discovering these plushes, a few answers have been recovered. Several years ago, Pat Mac and myself had rediscovered the plushes and their mystery, so we decided to look into them a little further and hopefully discover their origin. Through extensive digging, we uncovered an interview with Yuji Naka from thenextlevel.com that contains a photo set showcasing the inside of their offices. These photos in themselves are pretty incredible to see, just some of the old artifacts and plushes like Gamma and Hero Chow that are impossible to find nowadays. But if you look closely at the first photo of the plush shelves, you'll notice a sitting Knuckles that looks quite similar to the one from Anime Mate. And then on the other side, a Sonic, made with the same materials and style. And finally, a Tails, with blue iron on eyes and vinyl shoes to round out the set. Within these photos, we can clearly see the set that is the promo Sonic Team set that Anime Mate had somehow managed to get the Knuckles and Sonic from and sell on their website. But if they were sold, how did Sonic Team end up with them, and what's up with the story about their giveaway in the first place? Based on our research, these plushes were created as internal products for Sonic Team, around the time Adventure was being developed, as they're the earliest Adventure plushes that exist based on those designs, further proven by their colored eyes. However, the ones seen in the photos at Sonic Team were likely not the same ones Anime Mate had obtained, as the sold listings on Anime Mate predate the office photos, which implies two sets were made, one to keep at Sonic Team and one to be given away. But with that said, the way in which these were given away is still a mystery with very few leads to go off of. The fact that these are early adventure plushes, and with the date of 1997 that Anime Mate gives them, had led Pat Mac to believe they could have been given away at the Sonic Adventure Reveal Party, but we found no visual evidence to prove that. We've also never been able to solve where the Anime Mate ones ended up. They've never reappeared for sale or in a public photo after all these years, and there's no record of them ever having obtained tales who could still remain with the original owner of the plush. In fact, the most recent appearance of any of these plushes was on the Japanese website for Sonic's 20th anniversary in a section about merchandise. Sonic himself makes a cameo, sitting in a toy island inflatable chair, but the other two characters are not seen, and the plushes themselves are not discussed. Since these haven't been seen in so long, condition and preservation is something else to worry about, and if it weren't for the Anime Mate listings, it's possible the entire plush set would have remained in obscurity. Though to me, it's all about the fun of the hunt for these collectibles. That makes them worth finding, whether they're lost media or not. Similar to that whole idea of kids on the playground wanting to see adult versions of Spongebob, Mickey Mouse and the kid-friendly Disney content is another area where similar thoughts exist. What if Mickey Mouse wasn't so perfect all the time? In 1964, a student by the name of Robert Swarth took part in the UCLA Animation Workshop and created a piece of animation called Uncle Walt, which has lived on in rumor and mystery for nearly the entirety of its existence. The piece is a parody of Disney characters doing a lot of non-Disney things, according to a documentation of the short 
from Wade Sampson on Mouse Planet. The article goes on to describe its content. As the film began, pictures of Walt Disney at various ages were followed by a pan across a graveyard showing the graves of hundreds of Paris. And there were scenes with a very early style Mickey and Minnie Mouse with racial caricatures and outhouse gags. A Fantasia sequence, including the female centaurettes working a red light district with Goofy as a pimp, a scene of frightened little rabbit children looking at scenes from Disney cartoons, like the transformation of the queen into the old hag in Snow White, and a scene of the seven dwarfs gathering to worship Mickey Mouse in a mouse mausoleum reminiscent of a similar scene in Snow White. There was a rumor that claimed the animation was actually done at Disney in 1954, and wasn't intended to be released, but was allowed to be screened as long as it wasn't listed in the official program or advertised. However, this was debunked by Robert himself, when he stated it was a project that began in high school and was his first work before going on to become a professional animator on several different projects. But for as coveted as this animation has become to lost media enthusiasts and Disney fans, it's rarely been seen and there doesn't seem to be any plans to change that. The only documented public screening of the animation was in June 1972 at the American Film Institute as part of their 50 Years of American Animation presentation, and it's believed to have not been screened anywhere since then, with Swarth himself believing to be the only person in possession of a copy. Though I did find a Reddit thread from only two years ago, where a user claims to have gotten in touch with Robert and says he has no intentions to ever release it publicly. This was apparently confirmed after reaching out to a personal friend who had their contact info available on the UCLA website. But even if you have doubts this user actually did all of that, the outcome of never getting a release sounds pretty accurate to me. I don't see a reason why Swarth would decide to release it after all this time, when the interest has been there for the past several years. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other Lost Media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.